Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea on see the show on your TV so we talk about things musically. Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea. You're listening to Jams and Tea. Welcome, everybody, to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea, and today, oh boy howdy, do we have some shit to talk about today. We are going to be discussing on the main episode an album, a new album from two artists, hotly anticipated artists by the members of this podcast we are going to be talking about the new album from nick cave and warren ellis their first non-soundtrack collaboration album their new record carnage as well as the new album from julian baker we have little oblivions her follow-up to her sophomore record and very small yeah very small ones very small. not big ones it's just it uh, is because uh, julian it, baker is very small. Infinite, yes. infinitesimal oblivions. Yes. Itty bitty. And very small but very loud oblivions. But without further ado, we kick off as ever with our opening segment where we talk about records we've been listening to in the last seven days outside of podcast related stuff. Uh, Jake, what have you been listening to? Uh, oh, not to backtrack or anything, but um, I have a new book out today. Ah! Woo! go read i was about to say go watch it go listen to it yep that's it that's what you do they could stream listen to it. those who dwell in the dark stream mm. stream volume five motherfucker okay. now on spoofy <laughs> <laughs> my favorite streaming platform um. okay um i have been listening to um I, i've probably listened to more new albums not like 2021 albums, but just albums I haven't heard before this week than I have in some time. Um, first, I will shout out, well, I, I'll go ahead and shout out, I've been listening to pretty ravenously, just as like good background music, but also just good music to listen to because it is excellently composed and performed. And that would be the soundtracks of uh, the Studio Ghibli catalog um, uh, by Joe Hisashi. He composed all of them and they are all masterpieces uh they have like the original compositions on streaming but they also have like the symphonic versions i highly recommend going back and listening to those getting a little bit of nostalgia but also just some fucking excellent compositions for hearing films. it for the the first time earlier this week and openly weeping after yeah I, I got to show morgan princess mononoke like his like properly he'd seen kiki's delivery service but like mononoke is the fucking yes. like soundtrack yes yes and I just, uh, I, yeah i i want uh, <laughs> L- castle in the sky for the first time me too week. fuck yeah it's great right uh, is considering I put it in my top 10 favorite films ever made. Yeah, it's pretty yeah, right. right? <laughs> mm. But yeah, go... You feel like a child again. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's beautiful. I love but it. But I, to, to uh, call back to a friend of the show, Zach, I believe the, the incentive I had to go and listen to these on uh, their own was that Zach once said that like somebody was just like oh, is there a better album in 1997 than OK Computer and it's like yeah there's at least five but whatever but he responded and one of the albums he put for that prompt was in fact the Princess Mononoke soundtrack and it's like correct. I go and listen to it and I'm like you know he might have been spitting yeah <laughs> Radiohead <laughs> you're nothing <laughs> We we hate you. Just you suck. Afterbirth, Bad. Eli. <laughs> Just live it out of your mother's filth. <laughs> Afterbirth, Top York. Um, uh, but yeah, I've been listening to all of those. Uh, I have been obsessed with a an ambient uh, an EP uh, by a another Japanese artist uh, who goes by I believe the title of the project of the band is called Understatement but it's in like Japanese characters. So it's very hard for me to recommend. I'll try like throw up a link or something to it because it's like fucking incredible atmospheric ambient music. That's just like, I don't know. It, it, it's like therapy. It's, it's beautiful. I've listened to it maybe twice a day, every day, single day since I've heard it. I, I can't imagine a single member of this podcast not listening to it and liking it at least a little bit. So uh, that is dope. 
and I highly recommend it. I will also shout out fucking ambient ass Jake this week, I guess. Um, I listened to an ambient record uh, called uh, by the art, an artist called Apocryphos, which um, sounds like a black metal band. You look at the album cover for this, which I believe is called, oh yeah, it's The Prisoner's Cinema, uh, which, and it looks like a black metal album. You just see that and it's just like, that's, that's, that's nightmare. That's a nightmare. And um, it's, it's really like dark ambient shit, like dark atmospheric ambient, like kind of industrial tinged. Um, and it's fucking terrific. Like, ah, show stop at stopping stuff. Uh, th this artist does not get a, like, not particularly popular from what I can tell. They have like two ratings on Sputnik Music. Um, so I want to shout them out because that is some genuinely fucking outstanding music. Uh, more people need to pay attention to that. Uh, today and yesterday, I listened to two Mars Volta albums. I listened to Deloused in the Comatorium today and I listened to Nocturnicate yesterday because there was a tease from the uh, record label for the Mars Volta being like, yo, ooh, something mysterious. What could this be? And naturally, this chat freaked the fuck out for like it, it, twelve yeah, hours. There, there's there's a saying in in America, you, you, you fool me once, sh shame on me. <laughs> f f fool me, fool me twice. You, you can't get fooled again. <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah. how it I is, fucking it felt. Is, it's worth pointing out that the detective work that went on in that chat <laughs> was relatively close <laughs> to what happened. Blade Runner zoom enhance shit. We were on it, man. Yeah. And like we were holding <laughs> on to hope the whole time. And then it was just like, yo we're gonna reissue all of the vinyl. And we were like, what? And then they were like, all at once, and you have to pay five hundred dollars for all. Of it. And, and there's, like, and there's five only five thousand. And it's like and I was like, you know what, fellas, is the thing about this is fuck you. Is the <laughs> thing about this. Tyler Tyler put it the best yesterday when he said, "Boy, can't wait to download those black files off of Soul Seek." Uh, Couldn't like, agree more. I, fuck I enjoyed Volta what or, I enjoyed uh, more no was uh, my favorite band. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the spot is it's open. Very, yeah. But yeah, that's pretty much my week. Okay, I'll get right into it then. Uh, the first thing I listened to was from the Black Metal Pioneers, Bathory's Blood, Fire, Death. My this, favorite Bathory, this, fuck yeah! This is just... Viking an, metal. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an absolutely explosive, exciting progenitor of the Black Metal genre which uh, it's fucking great. I mean, every song has some like insanely memorable riff on it. There's like piece, it, it, it's just it's indescribably good. It's fantastic. Go listen to it. It's great. I, I'm at a loss for words. Uh, you can't go wrong with Bathory. You, you really yeah. can't. Except for when you can, when they are not <laughs> that good. Uh, speaking of bands that you can't go wrong with, except for when you can, I listened to uh, the new album by uh, one of my favorite bands, uh, Melvin's, the record Working With God. I was considering putting this on the docket for the podcast because it's their first record in like four years and I'm glad I didn't because this is not very good. It's Aww. just kind of, it, it takes a lot of the worst aspects of their sound and puts them at the forefront. It just comes off as really corny and, but, but not in like a way where you're having fun in a way where it's just like, this is embarrassing to sit through. Oh no. There's like, there's still like three or four really properly great songs on it, but it's it would not be worth it. It was just not very good, sadly. Damn shame, damn shame. Um, because I've been on a bit of a singer-songwriter kick lately, it seems, I listened to uh, Leonard Cohen's songs of Leonard Cohen, his, uh, ah. his first record, uh, 
full of just classic songs. Terrific. It's, yeah. Definitely some moments where I think his sound is a little less than refined where the instrumentation is just going for a little too much. It's a little too busy in contrast with these very sprawling involved stories he's telling, but it doesn't detract too much from the enjoyment of it. It's still yeah. quite good. I, I would say, um, and I probably don't even need to say this because it's such songs a massive album, hate. but yeah, Songs in Love and Hate is the yes. one. I think that's the best one. Also uh, opens with uh, one of his best songs, Avalanche, which is the very first song on Fuck. the very first Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds album because he covered it on the first Nick Cave record. And <laughs> and uh, of course, Songs of Love and Hate has like so many classic songs on it. Famous Blue mm. Raincoat, Joan of Arc, um, just yeah amazing record um his last album also really really good shit you yeah. i i think that's a very consistent like uh final record from him honestly like everything he did from the start through to say like the early 90s is either mm. great or underrated correct i agree no yeah. hard to beat uh another thing i listened to was uh uh, Converge's record Jane Doe. Uh, I had listened pretty, to this about a year ago and didn't connect with it then, really. And I'm kind of sad to say it didn't really do much for me now. I, uh, I don't know. Converge, their sound, at least on this record, it just doesn't do a whole lot for me. It's, it's tough to put into words. Like, I, I find a lot of the riffs really memorable. There's some really memorable, fun riffs. But overall, a lot of the the vocal stuff kind of takes me out of it, I guess. But uh, it's uh, it's not particularly for me, but, uh, you know. It, it sounds like um, you, you're probably not going to necessarily vibe with many of the other records then if the, based on those grievances. But I will say that, I mean, I th obviously think Jane Doe is a great record, but I think it's fair to say it's a little bit overrated. Um, you shut up. No, <laughs> stop. In the Tyler, sense, it's okay, I agree. In the sense that I think they got better from there. Um, yeah, and that's, that. Uh, like, yeah, fair. Absolutely, but like, it, it, just because Ghost Reveries is better <laughs> than Blackwater Park doesn't mean that Blackwater Park is overrated. It's just the it's the incorrect usage of that word. No, okay, fine. Uh, it, well, but, but I, I I do think it's a, it's a fair usage of that word for Jane Doe because it is this record that's held up as this like massive totemic achievement, and it is a great album, but it. It, and like all of their 2000s records get ignored in favor of it. And that just yeah. kind of sucks, man, because well, like they have some great shit in that period. And yes, you're right. But it's also like it was a totemic achievement for sure. 2000, yeah. 2001 or whatever. We can't yeah. look past that just because I don't, the, I don't think we're not saying that. We're, we're definitely you, I where think. you explicitly just said that. I, I did not. That is absolutely not what I okay, said. Okay, this this conversation has got far too pedantic. <laughs> I'm going to end it here. Yeah, sure. Yeah, August. Go. This week, I'm going to conclude it off, bringing back the Leonard Cohen with uh, Jeff Buckley's Grace. You know, it's a pretty classic uh, singer songwriter record. Very uh, full it's of fine. a lot of a lot of diversity in kind of the the sound the what it's going for in each individual song i mean a lot of it's it's pretty unforgettable the moments when when jeff buckley's voice just soars to the height of his vocal range and it becomes this this heavenly beautiful record it's uh yeah it's pretty consistently loaded with good songs uh it maybe ends a little weaker than it begins, and that's merely by virtue of it starting on such a high pedestal that, like, you, you I can't mean, really... Mojo Pin, enough said. No, I, no, not just Some... Mojo Pin, like yeah, Mojo no, Pin, Grace, uh... <sighs> Fuck. Fucking Title track might be the best one on Last there. Goodbye, uh, uh... of course, his cover of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. 
it warms my heart to see you say this about this because I love Grace so very deeply. Yes. I, I'm surprised that, unless I've forgotten that it is, I'm surprised it's not on their, um, their record club lineup because I feel like there's a lot you could dig into with that record. I, I contemplated it. I, I, I might one day, unless somebody else wants to also, which wouldn't be opposed yeah. to me. Let's, let's see what I have here. But yeah, that's continue talking. Yes. Well, that's uh, that's about all I had to say. Oh well, then that means it's my turn. So two records that I listened to were actually by the the same artist, uh, because I found out that they're releasing a new album today. In fact, um, I listened to two records by a band called Tiger's Jaw, who oh. came up at the same time and in the same place as the Menzingers. Uh, sort of an indie rock emo revival act kind of um so the second record of theirs their self-titled one is quite popular within that scene and it is very good um but i think either one or two records after that they had a huge lineup change and two of the people who were sort of in more supporting quote unquote roles in the band, not the primary songwriters, uh, move forward in place of the um, Jesus, um, move, <laughs> move forward in place of them and became the primary songwriters. Oh. And as from the from what I can glean, the general perception is that they somewhat fell off after that, and I could not possibly disagree more um uh the other record i listened to is spin which came out after that lineup change and i it's stuck with me way more um i just think it's a lot better so yeah there's that um another record i listened to is actually a 2021 release by uh a sort of Americana country singer by the name of Lydia Luce, who just appeared on my Spotify, I think like in the form of a playlist. And I was like, all right. Um, also very good. Um, just a lot of really strong Americana country songwriting. Um, fantastic voice. Um, yeah, very good. Um, and yeah, the other thing that I'll shout out is that I did, in fact, after we watched the movie the other night, I went and listened to the Princess Mononoke soundtrack individually. And just, I legit fucking, she... <sighs> yeah. Joe Hisashi doing all of those soundtracks in a row is as impressive as Miyazaki making all of those movies in a row. Yeah. Like Jesus. It's... It's like the, the the Howard Shore of it all. Mm -hmm. that, that is the only thing that I think even remotely compares to it, frankly. Yeah. Oh, another thing I will shout out that I forgot that I listened to um, is I just randomly gave a listen, a listen to uh, Howard Shore's uh, score for The Silence of the Lambs, which... Ooh. Fuck, I... For Fire. every award that that movie was nominated for the fact that he did not nab an oscar nomination for best score for that movie silly is is a farce because it's like the dude made the lord of the rings soundtracks and that's like still his second or third best work probably Jeez. so just like go like you've obviously seen the movie guys so what it, what part were you not paying attention to here the soundtrack to everything involving Hannibal Lecter's like escape in like the sort of transitionary second to third act and that is just like nothing short of the best shit I've ever heard mm. yeah it's... I just want to say um I watched uh Crash this week the David Cronenberg Crash oh uh, Cronenberg that was probably short too then I'm guessing yeah exactly um and immediately noticed that Howard Shore is um he put like electric guitar into the theme tune for that movie um and the whole score slapped so fucking hard he does such a good job with that um now that i'm saying that i, I regret not mentioning that in the article i just wrote about it but, but there was so much to say but anyway um crash great film great score you know 
Y'all know that he did the score for Naked Lunch with Ornette Coleman. What the fuck? Somehow, oh, yeah. somehow I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, what? I. Uh, That's I've fucking heard that. awesome. It's uh, what a fucking champion. So it's interesting. <laughs> good score, you know. Good film. Wow. Yeah, Damn. I would. I would imagine that it is, at a minimum, interesting. <laughs> From those two, it's like the best. Uh, oh, it's a banger! A f- film's a fucking banger. If you're into Cronenberg, essential. Yeah, uh, I it's see it. his best film. Oh, key! What have I been listening to this week? Um, so I went back to an album that I was obsessed with when I was 16 and older. That being the self-titled record by the 1975. Um, and it was, it was, it's interesting coming back to this as a slightly less young person, because so much of like the appeal of that record is like a certain aesthetic of youth that I just really don't identify with anymore. Like, uh, you know, the, we're dressed in black, head to toe, um, but the song that that line's from, that being chocolate, chocolate still. Yeah. yeah, chocolate's great. So fucking slaps. And it's like, as much as, um, I've slightly outgrown the cultural references of that record. There is, it is unquestionable. It is full of bops, uh, like girls. Yeah, I mean, if, Jesus. If you listen to the 1975 for lyrics, it's probably because you're you're a sociopath, right? <laughs> no, but like some of their best shit has is well, very well written. Like the best songs on their second record are great because of what yeah. Matt Healy brings to them. Uh, yeah. in terms of the and I, I actually think there are there are songs on the on the first record that are really well written like Robbers I think has a great story there um, and I love the music to that as well it's a, it's a good record um, yeah I agree it's, it's it's like he just he it's like he wrote a good thing and then went through a thesaurus and fucking picked out words that like were worse than what he wrote yeah. It's just and like he's just dumber sometimes. The opposite of the Cedric Bixler Zavala approach. Yeah. <laughs> and yet, uh, I still think that all of the records would be demonstrably worse if he wasn't the front man of that band. Yeah. yeah he is the that. glue that makes the band so unique. I was going to say, better, what would they even be without him? Or better or worse. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely true. You're not wrong, but I can also <laughs> say it's, it's bad. Well, the thing yep. is, is that because like it is sometimes his personality is so run through like everything about that band is that I can find him fascinating and obnoxious in equal measure, and it only makes me more interested in what they do. Yeah, I agree. Uh, that's exactly how I feel about the band. Well, that's good. Uh, this week I had a day of listening to just like three jazz records, and that's all I listened to. Um, there was an Art Blakey record, there was a Thelonious Monk record, but I want to touch on what I ended it with, that being uh, 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 Headhunters by one Mr. Herbie Hancock, which... Um, oh, is a big one. Banger! It, I, 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 it is one of the best records i've ever heard in my life yo the way it like blends genres and sounds um there are so many uh sounds this record brings it i took me by surprise and i had to like stop and be like this is happening now and i'm here and i have to absorb that um and it still uh was incredibly fun and enjoyable um, yeah, I, I I still remember you messaging me listening to Watermelon Man and being like so taken aback by the fact that that song opens with uh, Bill Summers blowing into a beer bottle and that's the melody, the melodic core yeah. of the track. It's so creative yeah. and so fun and and so iconic as well. Like just the sound of that record, it's kind of hard for us to appreciate kind of coming at it now and not really having the history of it. But the sound mm. of that record like changed like fusion it, it, it's just such a, a unique and it was a crossover hit like this was a record that was really popular with like people who weren't even into jazz or fusion or anything it's a record that had massive crossover appeal as well as feeling incredibly authentic and and fun and inventive and, and awesome and i feel like it's like the stooges raw power for funk 
yeah like it's it's, it's like a bl- like, it's like a blueprint it's like a real kind yeah. of minimal primal like it's not super um layered or dense or anything like that it's really peered back and straightforward but it just gets you on that real basic level and it just yeah. like it was like a progenitor like i would almost just desc- it would be accurate i think to describe it as like proto-funk yeah oh i i listened to it while i was um doing the final touches on a video essay which is going to be coming out on monday for our mutual friend davy um and it's it was such good music to edit to because it kept me engaged and engaged with like rhythm and f- just keeping it sort of fun and light and just it kept me awake and it, that it was really great like well, yeah i think just building on the proto funk thing like it's important to make clear like there were plenty of funk bands and funk records before headhunters but i think what that record did was it like it, it just it, it changed the sound of funk because like it's really iconic for the use of like synthesizers and stuff and it was like creating funk music th- through electronic instrumentation in a way that hadn't been done before um so like you obviously have like funkadelic in parliament and like the classic funk bands that preceded that record but it was like a new template yeah, I, th- I feel like it It might have been more accurate to say it was like the London calling of funk. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm also just rambling, so. Right. Well, in which case, I'll pick up the thread and say that um, I listened to Stories from the City, Stories from the Sea by PJ Harvey this week. Um, oh, in my girl. continuing PJ Harvey career retrospective, I guess. Um it is real different from the other records of her I've listened to, um, but real good. But I, uh, my the fight record I want to end on is um, a record I know Jake's listened to because we mm. talked about it. Um, and it's like previously on this podcast, I have not gotten doom metal. Like full, there have been records in that genre I've liked, but I haven't clicked with the genre. To the point where I, very wrongly, told you you probably wouldn't enjoy this very album. <laughs> yeah. And, but there was um, a day this week, uh, a couple of days ago, where I was the most down I'd been for months, question mark. And I saw that this record existed, that being a hour, 84 minute long song that forms an album it is a doom metal record called Mirror Reaper by Bell Witch. Oh, I listened um, to a Bell Witch album this week too. Neat. Oh, nice. Which one? Uh, Longing. Ah, I love that album. Anyway, uh, that sorry. was the one Continue. you recommended me in the comments. Of yes. My it, it's not better than uh, Mirror Reaper, but I might like it more. And... Okay, yeah. But wow. I spent two hours lying awake in pitch black on my bed, listening to mournful funeral doom metal and, and, and feeling like my heart was being held very delicately while someone cried at it. Um, I, I I loved it so much. And I, I it felt like an awakening to me in that, oh, this is like what one is meant to get out of this sort of... Uh, form of music and, in retrospect uh, i should have seen it coming just because that's a very emotionally charged album because i believe it came as a result of the yes. fact that the previous drummer died of cancer after it a really is, long and yeah. arduous battle it's in fact i think believed to be a tribute to him yeah it is um and you can feel it it's mm-hmm. like nearly two hours of real open grieving with guitars jesus it's, yeah it's, it's beautiful it I loved it so much. I loved yeah. it so much. It is not for everyone, but boy, did I love it. No, oh, yeah. Did you, did so, you love the record, Sersha? I wasn't sure if that was clear. Yes. Yes, I did. What did you? Okay. Um, <laughs> is that all you wanted to bring up? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I will keep this short. I actually have not listened to much new music at all this week. I think I listened to one... No, I didn't, haven't heard any first listens this week outside of um, what we're covering. Um, but I had some re-listens that I'll touch on uh, briefly. I re-listened to um, the first two albums from legendary 80s pop act Tears for Fears. 
uh, The Hurting. Yeah. Uh, the Hurting's a great record, incidentally. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also re listened to songs for The Big Cheer, uh, uh, notably the uh, Stephen Wilson remix that he did for the remaster, I think about seven years ago, which I hadn't heard that version of it. Uh, and it's like, it's as good as like any the, it's as good as anything has ever sounded the pop album the, the working hour uh, like even before the remix was like liquid candy being poured yeah. into your ears yeah and that, and after that remix it's just like i can i can die here it's like the album almost kind of feels like an extended ep in certain senses and that's not like a criticism at all like it, it's a very short record um but it's like it's short because it's like peered down to like the perfect length and it just like i mean all killer no filler in like the most stringent of ways yes and i've seen some hot takes about i believe but i think that it's a great ballad and it deserves to be there and um yeah hot takes why it has like a it has like a three point it has like a 3.1 on rate your music i think or something disgusting no but yeah anyway uh great record has three of the greatest pop songs of all time on it uh, including the greatest pop song of all time um it is just a fact um it's correct uh and yeah so i mean it's the fucking song to the big chair and it sounds great and i listened to it like three times and it was awesome um uh i i and i basically listened to those because i want to because i think last week jake shouted out their third record the seeds of love which i haven't heard yes. and i'm excited to get to that as well i would not be shocked if you like that one even more than those two honestly there's certainly room for a record to fit to for me to like a record even more than those two um uh, what else did I listened to this week? I revisited a great record, one of the great 80, another one of the greatest 80s pop records, but it's more kind of like chamber pop and it's um, Prefab Sprout's Steve McQueen, uh, a classic baroque, chambery, sort of beautiful, um, gorgeous 80s pop record with incredible hooks and um, just cannot recommend it enough. Prefab Sprout are one of those beloved 80s bands where if you're kind of really into 80s pop, then you know Prefab Sprout, but outside of the world of people who are super into 80s pop, they're kind of a little overlooked, um, which is a shame because their their 80s run is consistently great. I've talked uh, a number of times about their 2003 record, I Troll the Megahertz, which is very different and great in its own way, but their 80s records are outstanding and Steve McQueen is the one to check out first. Um and that's really it i think that's really <laughs> it i'll, I'll kind of just leave it there i think all right well that leads us into the first one which i is julian the first up in baker is julian yeah. baker okay <laughs> This is Julian's third album. Uh, it, it follows um, the longest gap between releases for her. Um, her last um, solo record was 2017's Turn Out the Lights, which was this big moment for her. Like, mm-hmm. uh, I was a fan. Uh, I am lucky to say that I managed to get in early on the Julian train, and I was a fan shortly after yeah. um, Sprained Ankle came out in 2015. And that's this game. Really- that's this really Ugh. sparse haunted and deeply tragic album um mm-hmm. that struck a chord with lots of people and then turn out the lights was her kind of um taking the template of that at, and her style as a songwriter and kind of blowing it up and having a band behind her and more uh fulsome production and yeah it was very kind of a cinematic arrival for her and it was an immensely successful record um so where does Julian go from there? And, and, and to be honest, I feel for Julian because while she's a very great songwriter and Turn Out the Lights was a really strong record, she works within a particularly kind of limited set of musical, a limited musical template. And it's very much kind of slow, sad, indie rock. And, and there's a lot of, you know, what can be done with that? How can you kind of turn something that could be minimal and empty into something that and something that really kind of like connects with people and is musically interesting and i think um julian has has done an admirable job of doing that as has phoebe and and as has lucy and so it made so much sense to see them come together for the boy genius project in 2018 hoping still that that um leads to a full lp at some point because it's a it's a it's a stunning ep um 
easily a highlight of the careers of all three of them. Correct. Uh, and so, but Julian had, did hit a bit of a uh, pit stop um, around this time in terms of creative inspiration as well as personal turmoil, as we'll get into. Um, but she is now back triumphantly with her third record, um, Little Oblivions. And dare I say, it is a kind of triumphant record in a sense, but I would also argue this is maybe Julian's darkest album yet. Um, I wouldn't even say maybe. I'd say uh, pretty much indisputably. <laughs> um, substantively, there, this is a record that is um, consistently embroiling you in uh, some of the lowest points of Julian's life and rendering um, the feelings um, that she experienced in those times so vividly that it's almost painful to listen to. Um, Hardline opens with these enormous jagged organ stabs that immediately signal this will be a harsher, more abrasive and generally darker record than Turn Out the Lights. Um, and it's worth mentioning as well that with Turn Out the Lights, even though that is obviously a very sad record, Julian's uh, aim with that record was to kind of try and find some real catharsis and try and find some hopefulness, try and um, find a way out um, and, and project that uh, message to our audience through the record. Um, but Little Oblivions is a much more difficult um, album and uh, it is uh, just completely wrapped up in the hardships that Julian experienced before making it. And specifically what the, the most um, pivotal aspect of her life that informs so many of the songs here is the fact that um, she relapsed into a crippling alcohol addiction that left her near yeah. death in 2019. So she suffered from a really uh, debilitating alcohol addiction as a teenager and as a young adult and became sober to make her first two records, I believe, and then relapsed in 2019. And it's an experience that is detailed in Hardline, among many other songs, with some of Julian's most raw lyricism. Um, the opening line of the record is blacked out on a weekday, immediately kind of submerging and throwing you into the middle of this kind of pit of despair. Uh, I'll split the difference between medicine and poison, she says at one point in the song. Um, and it's really, it's, it's that real sad girl shit that we love to, um, you know, just expel all of our emotions too. Um, but at the same time, it's it's very confronting and, and difficult and, and painful. Um, Faith Healer details the raw pain of reality after sobriety. It's a song about the urge to relapse. Um, I should clarify as well that Julian is sober now, thankfully, and we're great. It, it's fan That's fantastic news. Um, but this is really a record. Girl. This is really a record that embroils you in the midst of um, a time before that was really happening, where it was really, um, she was at her lowest. Uh, Heat Wave is a song about having a panic attack, sitting in traffic, stuck because a car ahead of her had spontaneously exploded. And so you get Julian kind of confronting or being forced to confront through this incident, her own imminent proximity to death uh, it's one of the darkest songs on the record it sees julian in a suicidal spiral um, the line i'll wrap orion's belt around my neck and kick the chair out is particularly chilling Fuck. Um, it's also not the only song on the record in which Julian has a panic attack on the road either. Highlight Reel imagines a similar scenario in the back of a taxi cab and in the middle of a crisis about whether her own life has any meaning, any lesson to be taken from it. The struggle of trying to pull yourself out of one of the worst phases of your life, but also forcing yourself to extract the lesson when all that it seems like you're experiencing is just pure meaningless pain. Um, Relative Fiction is an outstanding song, um, one of the best on the record, I think, uh, as Julian interrog interrogates her own self-perceived hypocrisy in wanting to help and inspire others to survive while barreling downward into one of her worst spirals ever at the same time. Um, a very kind of difficult song. Again, so many of these are difficult to listen to, but um, I think I find this really compelling. Uh, Julian's need to be saved during her darkest times, the way that having to be that person who her friends have to help feeds into her own self-hatred is reflected in the lyrics of songs like Crying Wolf and the show-stopping song in E. 
Um, the latter song in particular, another of the best on the record, sees Julian delivering devastating lyrics about being at the bottom of her alcoholic spiral, feeling as though she does not deserve to be saved. It's the record's most minimal moment, a stark piano ballad, and Julian absolutely carries it. Um, one of the best moments on the record, and this track that I suspect will be a bit underrated because it's kind of a deep cut, is the inventive and shining repeat, which I think is one of the best yes. songs that she's ever released. It has a fluttering major chord progression that both contrasts with the darkness of the lyric nicely, but also feels real and unironic, like imagining something better that eventually gets overwhelmed as the rest of the song turns darker. You have in the back half of the song, a four on the floor dance beat laying under Underneath the urgency of the arrangement as Julian sings about the twisted double-edged catharsis of being able to expel her worst moments through song but then having to do it over and over as a performer. Um, so I want to say at this point the lyricism on the record is uniformly excellent. Julian's always been a really strong writer and I think frankly that she's only getting better and better in terms of lyricism and her playing is also worth shouting out as well. I think Everything you hear instrumentally on this record, with maybe one or two exceptions, uh, is performed by Julian. And I think uh, one of the real surprises of the record is how great of a drummer she is. Um, she's really good and she gives a lot of heft to the rhythm on some of the heavier tracks here. And I think um, there are moments on this record where it threatens to kind of um, fall into a little bit of a sameness at certain points but then that her talent as a percussionist and as a drummer is what I think pulls the record back and and as the um, focal point or the um, linchpin of many of its strongest moments and I think of some of the more explosive tracks like a uh, hardline and bloodshot uh, bloodshot in particular is a curiously upbeat sound relatively speaking and would have made a great single it feels like an end of a in credits of a movie song and julian's singing about the tragedy of seeing the same kind of pain and suffering you're that you're dealing with in the eyes of someone you love and knowing that your relationship with that person could just as easily destroy the two of you through mutual destruction as it could help either of you uh, it's a really arresting song uh, Ringside continues the energy into one of the record's grittiest and most despondent moments where Julian's connection to others is impeded by her own feelings of guilt about the pain she feels she inflicts on them in letting them help her. Um, this, is, I, this song is what Julian originally wanted to be the lead single for the record, but she was eventually talked out of it. And honestly, I think it would have been a better choice for a lead single than Faith Healer, which is a good song, but I don't think really demonstrates the ways that the record differs from her previous ones. And here I think we get to my main sort of issue with the album. Um, Despite the quality of the playing and the lyrics, the arrangements themselves um, do leave something to be desired at certain points. It's not a universal issue throughout the record. I think on most of the songs I've shouted out, um, the arrangements are really compelling, great, solid indie rock um, that's well performed. But um, and it does mean that there are certain tracks here and certain moments on the record that do kind of blur together and maybe don't feel was fully realized as musical ideas. And one of the issues is that some of these songs are just a little too short um, as well. I think um, a, a great song, a, a song like Heat Wave, for instance, could and um, some of the songs towards the middle of the record could have been improved by being fleshed out a little bit more and having a little bit more um, ingenuity in some of the arrangements. Um, and I think, for example, um, Zip Tie uh, is a, not a bad song at all and certainly has some potent imagery. It's perhaps one of the most outward looking and topical tracks on the record, inspired by seeing demonstrators zip tied and wondering whether a loving God would not already have intervened. But it does le leave end the record on a, on a dour note that feels comparatively downbeat and uh, not like not as conclusive as the finales on her previous records um, that said it's still a really good album it's grown on me quite a bit I was not feeling a lot of it the first time I listened to it but the more time I've spent with it the more attention I've paid to um, the arrangements on the tracks that are more fleshed out and of course spending time with Julian's incredible lyricism I think this is the has the best writing on any of her records so far uh, I still um, think it's a really good album and 
Uh, I'm curious to see where everyone else falls on it. I mean, look, I feel like if you pay any modicum of attention to this podcast or me, it's just like, hmm, I wonder what Jake's going to think of this. And it's like, I mean, fucking like. Yeah, this is, I feel like this is. Mm. Yeah, I feel like this is going, I was thinking earlier, I think this is going to be the episode where everybody is just fucking predictable. You, you, you raise a good point. And like, obviously, um, yeah, I, I think this is pretty fucking stellar. Uh, main complaint with, um, Turn Out the Lights, which is an album I adore. Uh, one of my favorite albums, in fact, um, my only real complaint with it is that you go back to it and um, instrumentally it's, you know, it's obviously her doing a little bit more of a, uh, a sparse thing to sort of flex her songwriting and like mainly taking a sort of basic piano ballad approach to her sound. And it's like, you listen to an album like that and it's like, everything here is, is good, but once you put it all together, the lack of instrumental variety is what I think holds that back from me like saying that it's close to or near perfect is that it's just some of the production choices are a little bit dry and it, it, there's just not a lot like interesting things happening but she fills in the gaps because she's an incredible songwriter and an even better performer I think in terms of uh vocalists of the three um boy genius members I think she's by far the most talented her range is incredible and her ability to just kind of hold a note and just fucking bring it up and soar and hold it is incredible. You listen to songs back on Sprained Angle like Rejoice where she's just basically screaming. Yeah. And it's, she has, it's a, she has a great moment at the end of, I didn't get, I forgot to mention, but there's a great moment at the end of Faith Healer where the vocal really just swells in the great way that it does on a song like um, one of the, oh, is it Sour Breath on the last yeah. record? There's mm -hmm. a vocal swell at the end that I found really affecting. And she that's one of her great skills is her ability to kind of build tension through her vocal performances that that are kind of just building and building and building to this kind of like final moment of clarity that's really haunting small lady big sound it's i mean it's incredible when you see that she's like fucking four foot eleven and that giant ass voice comes out of her and it's like how did how did that happen um i i will also say that turn out the lights um also if i again were to just really get in there and kind of dissects a record that I love. It's also um, an album that's full of songs that are very structurally similar. And while they'll, you know, they'll have details that are sort of set them apart and obviously like the lyricism will be different. Uh, it, it can kind of uh, run together a little bit, which I guess is the only true disagreement I would have to say with Tyler is that like what I wanted after Turn Out the Lights is that I was like, okay, I want this writing, this attention to detail and this expanse. And I want a really like adventurous instrumental palette from her next album. Like I, I didn't know what exactly that would entail, um, but uh, I think she's done a phenomenal job at making all of these songs sound incredibly distinct. To me, they all have their own really fully formed identities. Um, it, I mean, I'll just get my only real complaint with it out of the way is that the, I do actually agree with Tyler in one assessment that some of the songs are just a teensy weensy bit too short. Uh, and it, what kills me is that it's like, oh, because I have a complaint with them, I don't like them as much. It's like, no, I, I love these songs. I just wish that they were 30 seconds to a minute longer, uh, which again, if that's my biggest complaint with a record, obviously, you know, you're in good hands. Uh, but Little Oblivions is weird because I didn't also like it quite as much when I first heard it and I didn't really know why. I had a weird journey with this album where I just kind of had to keep listening to it to be like, what is going on here? Because, you know, earlier records, pretty straightforward and easy to get, not that this isn't, but I was just sort of wondering why this was, it didn't have the immediate hit that like sprained ankle was for me. And then I just remembered like, oh, Turn Out the Light is also an album that took like a year to grow on me properly. So this makes sense. Um, and that's really just due to the fact that I think this album is overwhelmingly bleak, um, which is by design, of course. Uh, I, I think that like, this is not a, a complaint so much as like, this is just so 
potently emotional and autobiographical that it's just kind of difficult sometimes. Like basically the whole album um, on nearly every single song, Julian is obsessed with the idea of like things being cyclical, uh, just the sort of going through the motions and knowing that she is going to fuck up her own life and just like accepting that, which is like, I mean, I have been there. I have been there recently. It's a bad place to go. Um, and naturally, I think her very poetic lyricism displays that in full effect. But every song you can sort of boil down to an immediate fear of going back to the places she knows that she's capable of going. It's like the, the, the lingering specter of potential relapse is just haunted over all of these songs. Um, one of the things I love about Julian too is that uh, she was, uh, like if you read interviews with her, her talking about herself, uh, she's grew up in a very uh, like religious environment and she makes a lot of references to that in her music. And I mean, hell, I mean, Hardline just sounds like a cheap church organ at the beginning, which, you know, cheap, not a, this is not a discredit. It's like, that's what she's going for. And it sounds great. Um, and there are also like little tiny um, touches where you sort of hear like the the background, like there'll be the piano me melody and sort of like an organ underlying that in the mix. Uh, and that's always super cool. It reminds me uh, a lot of um, something like I Know the End on Phoebe Ridger's Punisher where it starts off and it's kind of got that whole televangelist church sound with the organ. Um, and she sort of has the idea of, uh, of faith and uh, religion sort of on her mind in a lot of the songs here, notably the absolutely fucking excellent song, Faith Healer. Um, uh, this sort of the sentiment, another like, I, I hate that I'm comparing it to this so much because it's like not really similar, but uh, thematically speaking, um, there's a lot of things that I get from this that I got out of Punisher, notably the sort of self-fulfilling prophecy thing um, as well as most notably on Faith Healer, the quandary of knowing that something or someone is bad for you, but indulging in this sort of dichotomy anyway, because it'll make you feel something, which is better than being numb, like she's talking about on the entire record and the way it's portrayed in Faith Healer. You've got the amazing lyric of uh, uh, Faith Healer, put your hands on me, uh, at least I'll feel something. Uh, and it's just like, ah, God, man, this is, this kind of hits. And I think that the, like, I just love the way everything on here sounds. There's so many moments of the like raw organic instrumentation that are just layered in this mix. And it's so fucking dense. It's night and day with her previous records and how they sound like she fucking literally made an album that was like, okay, uh, Jake, you, you, you had some small gripes with my other albums. I'm going to make an album to address them. And it's like, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I love things like in heat wave, there's sort of a, a weird kind of warbly synth in part of it that sounds right off of Stranger in the Alps, like on a song like Demi Moore or something like that. Or you have uh, the more, you have songs like Favor or, um, oh, what the hell, it's Repeat, where it's that final third of the song, just sort of those really like highly mixed vocal harmonies that are just like fading out. And it's it's gorgeous. Um, the only, I, I guess the only like downside to that is that some, some of the shorter songs you, you kind of want to feel more of a progression because songs like Hardline are like immaculately structured and there's just points again, again on songs like Hardline, Faith Healer, Ringside, uh, Repeat, and Zip Tie where they're just, they are noises that I can't quite fully pin down and I really like that. Like Faith Healer especially has that like moment near like the, like the, the two thirds of the way through the song where it just sort of like ascends and this fucking wall of weird warbly fucking noise descends on you. And it manages to blend that in a not awkward way because it has a lot of organic instrumentation, but whenever there's something a bit more electronic, it's put into the mix very tastefully in like in a euphoric kind of way. And uh, I think all this album does is just like, 
I am very happy she's sober. I'm very happy she bounced back from a very difficult year. And she clearly is working through shit on this album. But it's also like, I'm glad you're in a better place. But also, I really fucking hope you stay there. Because I, as much as I love this album, uh, listening to it, as I've come to understand it more, is quite difficult. I'd say it's like a synthesis of the dour, self-fulfilling negative prophecy of yeah. Rustin Kelly's dying star and the again this is like Punisher is a bit more subtle in the way it layers that sort of atmospherics and this is like this is basically her taking a bunch of shit from rock music that she really likes and like metastasizing it into her sound which is not something I would have predicted to have just never went to but uh, it's sort of those two records in a, in a happy medium of places. And I just feel like this is a real arrival for her because it's like, it's an album that uh, it takes a lot more risks than her other two records, which is like all the more miracle that it's like pulled off well, um, mainly because it's like, it operates in sort of a pattern of like, it'll start with two songs about Julian, like going through it with like her vices and, and what have you. And then the third song will sort of cap off and be like a fake slash hopeless solution to the problems she faced in the previous two songs. And then boom, it goes and does two more songs. Cause it's like, you have Faith Healer, you have Bloodshot. These are songs that are about like trying to find solace in something and not getting it on um, Faith Healer. It's just like relationships in general with Bloodshot. It's a little bit more specifically like a romantic thing uh, with Song and E. It's about drinking um, and Zip Tie is sort of the true acceptance of, of all of it. Just sort of the, like as the title implies, her, her hands are tied. She's sort of like just kind of there and is like giving up going through the motion. And I, I appreciate that like on a just more um, compelling uh, narrative thread, I suppose. Uh, and yeah, this is just, it's everything I want it to be. It's incredibly emotionally cathartic. It's produced divinely. I love how textured everything is. The instrumentations are, are dense and they're often loud. And it's, it's, a, it's a left turn for her in the best possible of ways. And it makes me really excited to see what she's gonna do after this, uh, just because Every time I feel like the Boy Genius crew does anything, they are like paving the way for a very, very long lasting and interesting career. Uh, they're not just, they're, they're all three of them are so very restless and they, they, they're not like trying to just, you know, make sad girl indie music because I feel like that's selling them, you know, a little bit short because they, what they're doing is really specific and like it's using a lot of different elements of different genres to, sort of build their own brand on it. And I appreciate that. This is an extension of that philosophy and idea. And it's, you know, it's personal, it's heartbreaking. It's, it's just, uh, it's an album that I definitely, you know, you, you gotta have at least one of these in a year so that you can have a, a sort of go-to emotional new release to, to carry you through the year. And while this might be a bit too bleak to do that as often as Punisher did for me last year, um, it will no doubt suit its purpose quite well. Um, but yeah, uh, unsurprisingly, I am very, very taken with this. Uh, and I would recommend it to anyone who's even vaguely interested in this kind of shit. It, it goes without saying, this, this was not particularly made for me. I really with The two most predictable opinions, I, I, one I, after the other. Right, yeah. Me and you. But that being said, I'm not going to give this a, a Chinese satellite type review where I just completely no takeaways from it. It's not for me at this point in my life because I do have some, I, have, I do have some thoughts. I think, uh, I think Hardline is a really fantastic opener. I think the best song on the whole thing I agree. It's this really um, hard-hitting, uh, grandiose, emotional track about alcoholism and the very cyclical nature of that, which I think, as Jake has kind of made a point of, uh, is is a lot of what this record is going for. I, I did recognize some of the, the purpose he was alluding to, and I think that really works well for the theme of alcoholism being this spiral which uh, Baker has been caught in 
in her life uh, two, three times at this point. I do not know the exact count because I didn't know the backstory to this, but Tyler explaining that really made it click for me. Uh, generally, I do find the, the instrumental palettes uh, diverse enough, interesting enough to keep me engaged. Uh, my attention didn't, didn't really wander while listening to this. Uh, as a writer, I think, uh, I think Baker definitely has her high points, like uh, Hardline, as I mentioned, Relative Fiction is pretty great, as is Ringside. Uh, although overall, I do, uh, I do have a bit of the issue that Tyler has where I'm like, this, it, it for me, tends to fall into a lot of just kind of indieisms. Uh, it, it feels a lot like what other people are doing to more effective degrees or, or I guess less effective degrees because I enjoyed this record a bit as I think I've, I've made clear. Uh, and, and we did talk about uh, Flowers for Vases recently. And I think, I think in a way there's some, there, there's a degree to which you can compare these records and that I think they go for very similar things things. I think this record is just, it, it does a lot of what that record does, but I think just a lot more consistently fully developed, well-written, and, but it does have that, that same trapping Flowers for Vases had where I, I felt parts of it didn't go far enough. I didn't think parts of this record were as fulfilling as they could have been. I think Jake made a good point about some songs needing to be a good minute or minute and a half longer just to to really drive home what's what's being uh, what's being went for. Uh, as for her as a vocalist, I it, it's kind of a Phoebe Bridgers situation where I'm just I'm not really into it. I can recognize. I recognize, and don't get me wrong, I recognize the quality of her voice. I recognize what it does for other people. It just doesn't do that same thing for me, you know? Uh, but yeah, the, the appeal is not completely lost on me because I think the, the moments where she, she really shows off her vocal range are where I can I can really get invested in what's happening on this record, get invested in the the narrative, so to speak. Um, yeah, it's it's a record where there, there's like no clean break where I think it's distinct for me. It's like distinctly ah oh, these song this crop of songs is good and the rest is forgettable. It's it's a mix of songs that I that just kind of completely miss for me. And songs where I can I can really latch on to what she's going for emotionally. I'm I'm really into it. Uh, but that that all being said, it's still it's still just a matter of personal taste why this doesn't work for me. In the same way, it's a matter of personal taste why this connects with Jake so much. So yeah, that's uh, that's kind of how I feel. I, and I think. I think it's interesting how that I've kind of ended up falling in between the two of you a little bit. I mean, obviously I'm a bit closer to Jake, but I do think there are moments throughout this record where I didn't want to use this word, but I'm feeling a bit emboldened now. There are moments on this record where certain aspects of the production and sound approach monotony. Uh, and thankfully they're fleeting, but I think songs like Crying Wolf and Favor, for yeah, instance, the, um, are, those are, ones. Are, are songs that definitely have some interesting musical ideas. And I think what Julian does, I think, to try and combat ha having songs that do, like Faith Healer, for instance, that sound very much like previous songs she's done, is by introducing some more interesting production details and, and, and flourishes, but it's sometimes not quite enough to make it sound particularly urgent or interesting for me anyway. Um, but yeah. It's kind yeah, of like yeah. with Turn Out the Lights, it's a very consistent production style. It's very consistently similar in sound. I think it makes for a more cohesive record. Uh, whereas this is deliberately more trying 
more adventurous, trying new sonic things, but ultimately as a result doesn't quite come together the same way, especially when you have multiple songs that are about the exact same topic. And Julian's really great at, at, at communicating the emotion and communicating difficult personal relationships that arise from um, issues that she has, but ultimately, yeah, it, it does hinder the record a little bit, I think. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, especially in terms of your choice of uh, tracks to kind of highlight for that, I think you really hit the nail on the head for me there. So I have loved both of Judy um last two records, um, Spray and Angle and Turn Out the Lights. Um, Turn Out the Lights especially holds a special place in my heart. Um, and... I have complicated feelings about this record because um, whilst I think the writing is immaculate, like verging on perfect, I mm, do not feel this record as much as Tyler and Jake, it has to be said. Um, and a big part of that for me is to do with the much publicized step up in instrumentation on the record because I don't feel like it's always as strong as it could be. And I feel like sometimes um, on certain songs, uh, like Bloodshot, for instance, it's kind of immediately takes sort of the soul out of the sound of it for me. And I knew this was going to be a problem because as much as I love some of the singles, some of the ones that people were raving about the most, uh, I didn't get. And I was worried going in, I mean, my problems are still there, and that, well, the, I love the lyrics and the story she tells is so beautiful and evocative. And I have my own struggles with, um, I have had my own struggles with um, addiction and destructive circles. And she captures the experience with all of the honesty I could ask for, really. Um, something like uh, the opening song, Hardline, I just feel nothing instrumentally here. And, that, and going back to Blood Drop for a moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler just broke. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I'm good. I'm good. It just took me by surprise is all. Yeah, like, is this, this kind of record I, in theory... No, don't, don't apologize too soon. You're still right. <laughs> <laughs> okay sure um yeah like on a song like bloodshot i i almost felt like the instrument the instrumentation was like almost like generic indie pop and it's just like the, I, in my notes i despite beautifully written lyrics you say are beautiful um i just wasn't feeling the aspect of it that being said there are lots of instrumentals i do really like on it like the guitar lead and heat wave um there's almost like a theremin kind of synth sound on this song that i really gravitated to um, and I love the beautifully searching chorus on relative fiction. Crying Wolf um, opens with this wonderfully tragic uh, story. It's really well told, and the music takes a step back. And like on an album like um, her last one, allows the um, storytelling to take the center stage here. And it, and I, I felt like it kind of clicked into gear, and I was like, ah. Yes, I, I know where I stand in this moment. And that, that was really great. Um, uh, even though I have sort of qualms with some of the with some of the melody of the hooks in the song, it felt slightly generic to me. That being said, Ringside, I love the song. Um, I think that the metaphor in the song of um, self-abuse as, as boxing really complements the more muscular instrumentation on this song. Um, and they blend together really well for one of the highlights for me. I also think Song in E and Repeat are also highlights. I want to highlight the lyric on Song in E. Um, I wish that I drank because of you and not because of me. Um, and this is amongst other I, just absolutely astonishing songs. And Highlight Reel ends a three song run towards the end of the record that I really, really love. Ringside also being on the back half of the record um, and Favour. Um, whilst I feel like it's slightly overproduced, has um, uh, some lines like the acoustic guitar and the self harmonization that really, really, really work for me. Um, and I suppose, in summary, I want to say I like this record, and I don't feel like 
I'm worried about Julian's artistic trajectory going forward. Because even if Julian is to pursue this line of um, self-expression through the instrumentation, I feel like this is more like a bold step in a direction that I feel like could do with refinement than a misstep. And I look forward to seeing what she does next, even if it's following in this vein, because I feel like there's real potential here if she is to follow through the aspects of it that work the best for me anyway. Um, it is good, but uh, coming off the back of two records I adore, um, I, I kind of wanted to, to connect with it more, I guess. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, I guess we don't necessarily That's feel... fair. I guess we don't necessarily <laughs> feel entirely different, you and I. I think it's just certain... Um, tracks we kind of do disagree on but sure. whatever well I knew that would happen when everyone was raving about um, the opening track and I just wasn't feeling it at all Morgan the boy yeah um, so a bit of context um, I also found Sprained Ankle in I think early 2016 and that released uh, late 2015 so I just I think I was just browsing audio tree uh, recordings uh, they have a lot of really good live recordings of artists like this and I happened to stumble upon it and was like Jesus Christ <laughs> um, uh, yeah that's still my favorite of hers mine um, too I have sprained ankle is um, I have a lot of there's history there, uh, like with the uh, Stranger in the Alps, which is still in many ways my favorite of Phoebe's, even though I I have to take a song out of it and replace <laughs> it with a different version of the same song to say that that's true. But um, yeah, I think Turn Out the Lights was a really good follow up. Um, there are certain songs on it that hit me like pretty much every song on sprained ankle still hits me um but i didn't think it was quite as consistent and i was really excited to hear that little oblivions would be a sort of expansion of her sound i kind of think of it as like the sprained ankle is elliot smith's self-titled turn out the lights is either or and this is xo yeah um yeah i can't i can't help but make Elliot Smith parallels between all three of the boy genius artists in some way. I held myself back from um, doing it. Totally right. But I think I th I think they invite it in some ways. <laughs> um, yeah. And you know, if I'm comparing you to Elliot Smith, you're pretty much a god in my eyes. So, you know. Um. And it, it, not not to you know be predictable again. But I do like this record quite a lot. Um, I think of the three boy genius uh, people, uh, I think Julian is the strongest writer. Um, not by a significant margin or anything, but she's always the I one agree. with the, the, the lyrical uh, voice that I connect with, as well as the one with the voice voice that I connect with the most. Um, but despite that, I do I do still prefer um, th both of Phoebe's records to uh, any of Julian's records still. And I think this comes down to the fact that, you know, I compare it to uh, Phoebe's records, but it really has to do with the fact that I think in some way, no matter how much I love them, the two records that... Uh, Sprained Angle and Turn Out the Lights both kind of felt like half measures in some ways where it's just like I, the songwriting is amazing here but I know that you can be doing more within the limits that you've set for yourself and instead of doing more with those limits uh, Julian has shifted the box that she's working with entirely which hey cool but it does kind of lead me back to the same problem of like you you should you know develop this stick with this and expand it more um i don't really have any okay well i, I have one specific flaw with it that 
harms the record, but I'll get to that later. Besides that, I don't really have any particular nitpicks. Um, I think some of the, th the songs could be fleshed out more. Um, I'd certainly like some of them to be longer, um, but even if it's just repeating some of the same ideas and motifs within that song, that would be all it needs to make me happy in that regard. Um, I think songs like the singles Hardline and Faith Healer are fucking breathtaking. Um, I, I posted on Twitter earlier today about the uh, the keyboard line and Faith Healer oh, and like so the good. Mid section of that song. And I just, I just, I, 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 I nut is the thing about that when that keyboard line comes in. It's just, I, I, I start flying emotionally. Um, and pretty much every song has that sort of power in some way or another on here. Um, I find it to be a remarkably consistent record in that regard. The problem that I have more than anything else is that I sort of, it's the way I would say it is like, if she stuck with the mixing on uh, turn out the turn out the lights and uh, sprained ankle vocally for this record, while keeping while completely changing up the way the record's mixed in every other way, and that I think that the vocals on here are mixed too fucking quietly. <laughs> um, I really have trouble making out a lot of the lyrics sometimes, which, you know, is not always a bad thing, but she's never singing particularly fast and her delivery is not ever illegible, but it's just mixed to sort of on the same level as the instrumentation in some places. And it sort of kind of gets washed out where all I catch is just the syllables of it and not necessarily like the words. I would also say that this is vocally her best album in a lot of ways, but it just gets lost in the mix sometimes. And I find that really frustrating because I, I want to think that this is like a nine and a half or a 10 out of 10 record. And it's just, it just keeps holding itself back. And I find it really frustrating, but you know, to be clear, it's a freaking great record. <laughs> and I like it a lot, and I will be coming back to it over and over again throughout the year. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll say to its credit, um, I think I already said this, but uh, of all of Julian's records, I think this is the one that has um, rewarded most um, revisiting it and listening to it over and over and over again. Whereas with her other records, the re-listening was for pure joy. Um, and But this record, I, I re-listen and I get this, this the joy of the record, but also I feel like I'm unpacking it more and more and more. Mm. And yeah, I, I think there is definitely um, a decision, maybe not even a decision, but just like a necessity to mix um, Julian a bit lower because she's kind of trying to move away, I think, from singer-songwriter into a, a, a sort of a full band sound. I know she memorably tweeted around the time the album was released that um, we're a post-rock band now. <laughs> Interesting use of we, uh, considering that there's only other people when it's a live band. But but I think it's kind of indicative mm. of the fact that she's mm. trying to expand beyond the limits of um, her previous two records and perhaps hasn't quite fully this is I hate to use this word but it's kind of maybe a bit transitional I do actually like identify with Morgan's complaint a little and I think that's kind of what held me at arm's length when I first listened to it and I think like you know this is obviously a double-edged sword I don't think this is a like complete improvement but like just the way that the vocals and the instruments mix similarly it's just like it creates a conflict in the record that I think f feels tangible considering what it's about, where it's just like, you know, if her voice were a little bit louder, I feel like that there has to be some sort of technical aspect that like 
makes her feel like she's being overwhelmed by something else. And the problem is, is that they've done that, but they've done that at like a slight sacrifice for something else. And what they need to do on the next record is find a way to do that without necessarily doing that. It's a, it's a sacrifice for something that's more important. Yes. Which is being able to fucking hear her. Yeah, that's so totally. Anyway, let's move on to our favorite yes. tracks yeah. and ratings. Um, Jake, why don't you go first? Uh, difficult because I pretty much love every song here to one extent or another, but I will say Hardline, Faith Healer, got to go with both. And if, got, if I got to pick and rate this something else, I'll probably say Song and E. Uh, least favorite track? Um, I don't know, maybe Highlight Reel. It's a great song. It's just maybe the one that's left the smallest impression on me. And I and I can only really say that and be, like anything negative about this at all is because I've listened to it like 27 times. But like, yeah, that's just, I have become keenly aware of what I do and do not like about it. That said, it's great. And I, it's it's tentative, I suppose, but I, I, I give it a, a hearty nine. Right, August, what do you think? Um, well, my favorite tracks are Hardline, Relative Fiction, and Ringside. Least favorite is Crying Wolf. I'd give this a... Let me turn off the web filter so you can see the stupid rating. Six out of ten. Whoa! Wonderful. Six and a nine? Nice. Indeed. Well <laughs> Uh, my three favorite tracks are Faith Healer, Relative Fiction, and I will say, uh, what will I say? Uh, what hard, will he bro. do? Uh, repeat. I'll, I'll give it up to that. Uh, least favorite is Crying Wolf. Um, even independent of my sort of uh, complaints about the mixing. That song just doesn't leave much of an impression on me uh, musically. I, I, I have, I struggle to remember it. Um, but anyway, uh, I will give this an eight and a half out of ten. Neat. Um, so, pour moi. Um, my favorite tracks are probably uh, Ringside, um, Song in E. And uh, let's say um, Heat Wave. Fuck it. Um, I'm going to get the right. Oh, my least favorite, which does exist, is uh, Bloodshot. I'm going to get the record a six and a half out of ten. Okay. Um, my three favorite tricks are Hardline, Repeat, and uh, I want to say Relative Fiction, but another part of me wants to shout out an underrated song so now i'll just go with relative fiction um least favorite trick uh it's either um zip tie or favor uh, i think i feel about the same about those tracks they're a little underwhelming but uh i'll go with favor although one thing i want to shout out shout out about that song that i'm surprised no one else mentioned is that um phoebe bridgers and lucy davis yeah. do backing vocals on that track um but yeah, it doesn't do too much for me, that song. I'm going to give this album a 7 out of 10. All righty, ho. So that's uh, 7.4 on average, um, which is equal to, give me a sec, uh, Full Circle Nightmare, Sing to God, As the Love Continues, What a Tricks Point Never, uh, We Will Always Love You. That's two consecutive new releases that we've given a 7.4 on average. Crazy. Um, not that that means anything, but numbers are fun. <laughs> um okay i agree magnets how did they work all right so now we move on to our second uh main oh. review. new album from duo nick cave and warren ellis warren ellis uh, if you don't know, has partnered with Nick Cave on several movie soundtracks, uh, things notably like The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford, just fucking stacked all of them. Uh, Warren Ellis is also a member of the Bad Seeds. I don't remember when he joined the band. He came um, ago. He's been in the band oh, for okay. a long time. Yeah, he, he's, he's been sort of integral to that, but I think um, 
in this sort of new decade of Nick Cave's career, like the 2010s trilogy of records he um, released, I think it's basically undeniable that Warren Ellis has taken a more prominent uh, uh, role in shaping the band's sound just because of how expansive and spacious and very just very particular ways that they use different timbres and like electronic textures and just interesting new things that you would have never thought Nick would explore if you looked at his work 20 years ago. Um, but uh, they've sort of partnered and, you know, you can hear his influence on albums like Push the Sky Away on Skeleton Tree and very, very, and most prominently Ghostine, I think. Which we're going to talk about in a few weeks. Um, which we will talk about in a few weeks. Uh, and we're, that'll yield an interesting discussion. But I think it's like, even though this is not a Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds album, I still feel like it is very much in keeping with the direction that they took in the last decade, just because this album has Ellis written all over it when it comes to the actual sound yeah. of it. Uh, what's I think important to mention about Alice that separates him from the other members of the Bad Seeds is that he is not just like an instrumentalist, he's an arranger of sound, yeah. like he's a composer and arranger um, and the, you might not necessarily on first glance if you didn't know better, realise this wasn't a Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds record because yeah. it is so instrumentally dense, like there's there are tracks here like Old Time for instance that have so much going on instrumentally that it's a real kind of festival of sound and, and beautiful musical arrangement. Festival of sound. That's a fucking brilliant way to put this album. I did. Did he just drop this out of nowhere? Was there like even any notice for this? He, he it, said he, on he the said Red Hand was... files that they had recorded an album in December. This was the album was recorded mm. in a few weeks in December. Yeah, and he said that he dropped it um, very casually in response to a reader letter on the Red Hand files, um, but gave no indication of when it would be released. So the su- re- oh. release was still a surprise. Yeah, which I think is like, first of all, just cool. I, I, I don't think it's a secret. We've pretty much all at some point expressed a genuine love for at least one of Nick Cave's albums at some point over the course of this entire podcast. So it's not exactly surprising that we're all kind of hyped for this. But like in any capacity, when Nick drops music, it's just like, it's an event. And I, I don't know. Well, I mean, I do know why, but like you get this album, you have Carnage. It's like, well, first of all, that's a fucking name. Nick Cave makes an album called Carnage. You fucking pay attention. Um, it's also eight tracks long and at a very, very uh, lean 40 minutes, like exactly. And uh, which immediately got me hyped because it's just like, well, I see that. And what that says to me is all of these songs are going to be an event. This is going to be like a really dense musical project where all of these things are like really purposeful, really like just th- they want something to do and something to say with all of this and doing it not under the bad seeds is just a curious choice. Uh, so, you know, it's like, I think it's like purely a technicality. Yeah, the, it the, does. The, remainder well, of the bad seeds just weren't well, it's, involved. It's, it's also what got me really excited about this album is everything you said is eight tracks, 40 minutes. And Nick Cave in the build up to it said that um, I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember the exact thing. But basically the idea of the album is that it's examples of like brutality amongst like beauty reflecting troubled times. Yeah. And yeah. that seems like the perfect encapsulation, not only of the record, the, but of how we were all feeling. The phrase, to the, the phrase he used, I think, is that it was a, a reflection of our collective trauma. And I think the decision to release it as Nick Cave and Warren Ellis wasn't like a conscious decision. It was more reflective of the fact that under quarantine, it was very difficult for the band yeah. to actually get together in the first place. And so Nick and Warren, it was very much an impulsive thing that just happened between the two close collaborators. So, Which I think is like, that is a very important thing to mention because I think this sort of like follows in the stead of like you know we've you know we started the podcast last year we have had to deal with uh many artists just you know making the the quarantine record it's like this is just something that is basically inescapable at this point because of how long this continued it affected albums that weren't finished when it came along it affected albums that were finished when they came out who fucking knows but it's like this is distinctly like 
I don't know, it, it's less like of a artistic expression of like frustration or, or loneliness from within. And I feel like it's an attempt to, to harness something collectively and then like bring it together through their voices. And I think that the album as a result ends up being one of the most fascinating Nick Cave projects he's dropped so far, because while not unexpected in, in any way, it just like, this dude has been making incredible shit for so long and he has reinvented his sound in so many minor but like ultimately very very noticeable changes that it's like you know what even is nick cave in 20 in the decade 2020 like what even how do you do that how do you define that but instantly you get hit with a song like hand of god which is fucking like it it has these moments in it where I can only describe the music as being like at the top of a roller coaster and then fucking like the moment where you feel the organs in your body shift in and like right before you plummet fucking downwards. It's like, it's a standard song and all of a sudden it'll be like that weird fucking string noise. Yeah, I don't even I, know what the fuck it is. It's I, just like, I would, I, would de I would describe it as like on the way up a roller coaster and then you look back and see that the roller coaster is falling apart behind you. <laughs> and then, then you realize that it's come up right behind you and then it, it, it falls apart and then it falls apart past you and you hang in the air like a Looney Tune for a second and then you drop. It's, yes, fucking perfect. Like I, when I listened to this, that moment caught me so off guard. And then like, I was just like, whoa, okay. That took me out of my like expected headspace for this because I mean, I, I heard like the opening part of the song and I was just like okay well I, I I will try and expect a ghost team kind of thing happening here and that's not what happens at all despite the fact that they have similar palettes at certain times it's just hand of god is just it, it has those like moments but when it gets into the song proper and then you have those weird little vocal refrains of Nick going hand of god hand of god I believe, that, I believe that's Warren actually oh really okay well then uh Warren doing that, which is just this mm. manic feverish thing. And then the way it builds into mm. that third part of the song where it's basically a fucking choir. You're just like, I did not see this coming. And then that's basically just a microcosm for everything this record does is that it's just a, it, it is adhering to no rules other than the ones Nick and Warren are setting for themselves. And as a result, it is a beautiful album that is written with the sharp fervor of something that you would expect on Nick's earlier stuff. Like not to say that uh, his later stuff isn't like cutting or like even brutal in some ways. It's just that emotionally, there's a specific vibe that he gives off in those 2010s records. There's a there's a there's a vulnerability and uh, a maturity to them even whereas here it kind of feels like this is hearkening back to another era where it feels like somewhere in between something like um uh let love in or at times even something more down tempo like the boatman's call um but it does it in a way that we've never really seen before and you just there's so many show-stopping moments on each one of these songs. I feel like with the Julian Baker record, we, you know, sort of maybe came at odds a little bit in terms of like how each song was like developed and how it like had a distinct identity, which I think with this album, that is indisputable because every single moment is so fucking holistic. There's moments on shit like White Elephant, which I think is an album standout on an album standout uh the just the the imagery here is fucked um mm -hmm. i i think at least the this is the one that yeah it's because it talks about the, the the white hunter at the beginning and then the kneeling on the statues of a protester and them saying they can't breathe which is like you know very prescient that it's it's pretty you can't miss what he's doing here but like this apocalyptic imagery that is so very essentially Nick Cave. It's, it's not like it's weird in the very distinct ways that it can be. Um, and it has these moments of like 
despair of like hope like on something like Albuquerque but that hope is tinted by something that's like downright hellish on the horizon there are moments on this album where I was actually reminded a lot of Tom Waits um not maybe even vocally but just like lyrically uh shattered ground even also just kind of sounds like a mule variations like lyrical era uh Tom Waits and shattered ground by the way is like probably my favorite song on here fucking in insanely gorgeous like one of the most beautiful things i think i've ever fucking heard and then yeah fucking balcony man which is just like bitch you thought and i don't know it, it's a very difficult record to get into without dissecting its specific points but this is so like i didn't know what i wanted from a new nick cave album because ghostine is very much like that album feels like very conclusive of just like this is probably the end of an era for him as like a you know uh, as an artist like I have a feeling we're gonna be going in a new direction if he continues to make music so beforehand it's just like what is what do I want from this and I, he is good at giving you things that you didn't know that you wanted I, I I just think that the the sound here is so refined it's so fucking like it's such an ominous it's such a bleak record but it's never overbearing i suppose um weirdly enough i think it's less overbearing than fucking uh, little oblivions was but uh yeah i, I i'm just kind of fascinated with it just like as a project i don't even like this sounds pretentious as fuck but i don't even view it as an album it just feels like this overwhelming sensory experience that's just fucking transcendent at points there are like moments where i feel like you know, maybe the production is a bit too spacious for its own good, and it's a little bit like, I, I want there to be as, as many, like, I, I just want them to go as fucking ham as they have been uh, in terms of musical ideas, but th even then, it feels like those moments give you a little bit of a lull to guide you in and out of this sort of flow, because these are really structurally ambitious compositions that are happening, uh, but yeah, I, I love this thing, even though I can't truly properly articulate why but well, like I, mean, if, I think like with ghosting and like with skeleton tree to some degree you need like years yes to, <laughs> yeah that's really good to to live it. with it yeah um this right. yeah. Uh, record is fucking amazing i would say i'm gonna go even further i think this is one of the best records nick caves ever put out um just ever i would put it i would say if not for ghostine that it's his best record in 20 years um i love it that much uh and i think it is uh to a certain extent because there it is so musically diverse whilst being so minimal and so peered back but also it's uh i think really interesting content wise as well and thematically it is very it's one it's very straightforwardly a quarantine record um nick is a very uh you know layered and and clever writer so obviously you can read multiple meanings into lots of these songs but i think all of them can ostensibly be viewed through a lens of responding to um the quarantine and to the existential um feelings that arise from it um there are plenty of moments on this record that confront that head on in a really direct way um uh yeah every, every song here has its own unique kind of musical and thematic identity but also there's an interlinking in terms of nick's writing between tracks that's really interesting i think um that with the exception with the notable exception of white elephant i think that every song here actually i kind of disagree with jake in the sense that i think it departs from the fragility or vulnerability of the last few records i think it's in, for me it's it's in keeping with those for the most part um but it's that nick is his writing's a little kind of wrinklier than it was on ghosting for instance and, and kind of more akin to sort of skeleton tree in a lot of respects um least of all in the in the structure of the record which mirrors that record um structurally um, Hand of God is is just an absolutely stunning uh, opening track, one of Nick's best opening tracks ever. Uh, it is eerie, it is thrilling, it is urgent. 
I love the pulsing and distorted but muted industrial thump that comes in after that you know terrifying string swell and the rest of the the way that the cinematic strings engage with the rest of the track is um absolutely uh haunting and 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 scary um and nick moans dramatically of kingdoms in the sky and rivers casting their spell on him in fact this notion of a kingdom in the sky is actually a lyrical motif that nick um touches upon many times throughout this record uh, I'll kind of hopefully we can unpack that a little bit um, as we go on. But um, it's a stunning opening track. Um, old time rose, rolls slowly into view. It sounds even more eerie with its low humming evil bass backdrop and these kind of twinkling and cascading piano chords that are hammering into the mix. There's so much detail in the production here, um, courtesy of Warren Ellis. It's not just a matter of the record sounding great, it is the record is packed with detail that adds so much emotional heft um, instrumentally um, to what is happening to the point that uh, I would argue that it's it's so fitting for this to be billed as a Nick Cave and Warris Allen, Warren Ellis project because uh, essentially they both have equal presence uh, on this record and they both contribute equally to um, the totality of what it is and why it's so great. Uh, this is not a Nick Cave album. It is a Nick Cave and Warren Ellis album. Um, the uh, On this second track, Old Time, that falling string swell that uh, Morgan and Jake alluded to that starts at the beginning of Hand of God uh, recurs in this song as well in the background at certain points. Um, there are these, I love, I'm not sure if it's a cello, but it's some kind of like bassy stringed instrument that has a solo in this track. It's heavy and gaunt, uh, it's twisted, and it sounds absolutely bone chilling. Um, it, and, it's disgusting. I love it. Yeah. You also get these occasional scores of guitar feedback that kind of feel like they're penetrating into the mix, like they're trying to scrape through the fabric of it. It's really great shit. Um, lyrically, the song is post apocalyptic. Nick is singing for, of escaping from a land of black trees that hide horned monsters. Uh, it's less arresting or conventionally beautiful than other tracks on the record but to me this is what makes it stand out i think it's a fantastic song one of my favorites here um carnage the title track is very much the thesis statement of the record i think nick sings of trying to maintain hope and wrench a meaning a significance a divine lesson from the crisis uh, the track is more subtle, withdrawn, and openly moving than the previous two, with a gently pretty melody and these ethereal backing vocals. It's um, very easy to see why people have gravitated towards this title track. It's very beautiful. Um, White Elephant, of course, is the record's explosive centerpiece. I'm sure many of you will have plenty of things to say about this track, but I want to. One thing I want to shout out is the bass in this track is overwhelmingly heavy. It is sickening and oppressive. Takes your fucking organs. Yeah, uh, Ellis's dramatic strings enter again. Uh, honestly, the string arrangements on this record consistently on every single track are astonishing. Um, I, I love the way that his strings enter so dramatically beneath the line, I'll shoot you in the fucking face if you think about coming around here. That's such a great moment. Where that the delivery too is like, it's not like fully quite sung, yeah. but it's just like, like I'll shoot you yeah. in the fucking face. I'm, I'm going to tell around. you now, I have been listening to an audiobook the Nick Cave reads of his own novel, um, the death, the death of Bunny Monroe. Um, this is a dark, very horny, and very sad novel in which a sex addict's wife kills herself when he has to deal with grieving and taking care of his own younger son. Um, and Nick Cave's reading of the whole book is like that line. It is, it is traumatic. Yeah, and, and, and you really get a sense on this on this record, um, more so than anything he's done uh, in a while, of the sheer vocal presence he can have. Like, I think um, one thing that's underrated about some of his more recent records is the way that he has been kind of expanding his range as a vocalist and, and yeah. exploring things like falsettos and stuff. But it's a real testament to the fact that 
it's a real testament to how inventive he is that this record feels like it is still achieving new vocal heights for Nick. Um, um, so the song is um, it, it, when these kind of dramatic strings enter beneath that kind of that line, um, you see Nick is adopting the perspective of a white supremacist terrorist quite boldly and directly. Um, the song, I, what I love though, is how the song is still shrouded in thrilling metaphor. It's a, it's mm. both straightforward and oblique. Um, there, Nick has references to Greek myth in this song and ice sculptures. Um, but his, the difference is not that this is necessarily more straightforward in its subject matter. It's just that his illusions are clearer than ever. Um, the song's startling shift midway through is something that sounds triumphant, but also in a sardonic and mocking way uh, is really kind of spine tingling as you have Nick's character ex espousing extremist rhetoric, encouraging his followers not to ask questions, but simply to fulfill their God-given duty, which we can interpret based on the rest of the song being murdering innocent people. So as to be redeemed in the kingdom in the sky. Again, that reference to kingdoms in the sky comes back. And it's like you get references throughout this record, the record to this kingdom. And it's like this ultimate divine place that is this, ideal um goal for so many different people but the um fact that it is this place of salvation but also this place of that where these you know horrifically evil characters also want to go this and and he deconstructs the idea of heaven really nicely and kind of points out some uh, really kind of uh, unsettling hypocrisies or unsettling contradictions in it um in the way that he reuses that line um yeah really really uh unsettling and, and enormous song uh I, I and obviously people have talked people are, have talked a lot about it and have, have spoken a lot, a lot about the more huge and immediate first half of the record but honestly i think i like the second half of the record even more than the first yes. half um, Albuquerque yes. is an arresting, beautiful piece that continues the cinematic vibe in the string arrangements, uh, which is no doubt a sign of the duo's soundtrack work echoing into these new compositions. It sounds very, again, like filmic. Um, it's mm -hmm. this gorgeous song. Uh, it's quite, I think, one of the most, again, like White Elephant, it has quite a straightforwardly topical interpretation in terms of being about the quarantine. Uh, lines like, we won't get to Albuquerque anytime this year. We won't get to anywhere, darling, unless I dream you there. Really great stuff. Uh, really um, moving in a very straightforward way. And I don't think that the straightforwardness of it um, takes away from the effect. If anything, it enhances it. Um, uh, becoming from Nick Cave, it enhances it anyway. Uh, Lavender Fields is equally gentle and slow, but even better. It alludes once again to the kingdom in the sky, but it appears to be uh, a vision of that place. We've had mentions of it as this um, conceptual thing that characters um, are... You, characters utilize um, in terms of their motivation or envision but here it's like this song is actually a a journey a a an actual approach of that place uh, which is imagined and conceptualized as fields of lavender and nick is kind of casting this late stage of his life as a journey towards these lavender fields and this kingdom in the sky and and this marks a point on the record where you get a consistent uh, a shift into um, a consistent lyrical interest for Nick in existential issues and questions of his own mortality. The record gets much more personal in the final stretch in a way that really startled me. Like, I, I feel like I shouldn't have been surprised because of how personal Nick has been on Ghosting and his recent records. But it was almost like the first half of this record set me up to expect um, something more, less tangible, something more kind of like. Uh, Dense, densely metaphorical whereas he actually gets really straightforward towards the end of this record in the same way that he does on ghostine um mm -hmm. nick's fascination with death and the feeling of closeness he has had to death for the last six years in particular ripples across this record like it did through ghostine and i think that lavender fields is the song that bears the closest resemblance to that record and it's almost like a a link between the two or a, a an example of the way that he is 
the effect of that record, the sounds of that record is kind of rippling through to the new directions he's thinking about taking his music. Uh, and I don't necessarily know or even think that Carnage is going to be indicative of where um, Nick wants to go musically next. And I think the, that's especially due to the fact that it's explicitly not uh, a work with the Bad Seeds. But it's it's you can see Nick's you can see Nick's kind of musical and thematic and lyrical trajectory shifting through this collective trauma in real time. It's like, I can see why Nick felt so compelled to make this record because he has just made a record reflecting for like 70 minutes on his own trauma and grief. And then the, this horrible grieving process happens to the world where you have hundreds of millions of people dying. And, and no wonder Nick, who is still in that, headspace from ghostine would want to make a record reflecting on that because it's like he has in this unique part of his life where he is able to express and understand those feelings in a way that maybe he would not have been able to before and so this is just one of those records that's um we're lucky to have it's it's he struck while the iron was hot so to speak and it, it, yeah it, this record obviously would not have happened if not for the the COVID-19 pandemic and so it's uh, a beautiful reflection of um Nick's headspace through that and and a cathartic kind of expression of of how we're all feeling from it and obviously we've had plenty of records that have done that but i don't know with nick it feels more like he has a right to do it because yep. of what i've just said because of his um how he's been basically processing the same emotions that have been inflicted on the rest of the world for the last few years I'm rambling a bit now but you get what i'm saying uh shattered ground uh <sighs> my my favorite song on the record also jake uh one yeah. of, one of nick's most commanding vocal performances and decades he summons a fiery heavy energy that booms against the minimal beauty of warren's arrangement i believe this to be another song about nick and his wife susie's experiences with processing the death of their son arthur uh, in the first verse he refers to the moon as a girl with the sun in her eyes evidently um, talking about and rendering his wife through um, metaphor and and imagery he's spoken about um, the way that she informs so much of his songwriting is, and is imbued in his songwriting a lot on red hand files and um, in many ways this feels like a song in which Nick is grappling with the possibility of her death um, and, and just being um, you know overwhelmed by his existentialism and um, the way that his grief has kind of fed into the way that the two of them view each other and view the other people in their lives, the sense of um, impermanence that they have. Uh, and, and Nick gets really emotional in this song, uh, whether it's unclear at points whether he is addressing his wife or his son in the lyrical passages towards the finale of this track, but he becomes overwhelmed with emotion and uh, it is a truly um, show-stopping and, and uncomfortable and, you know, tear-inducing. Um, He's just saying goodbye over and over and over again at the end, and you're just like, fucking... Yeah. Shh, fucking and, then you, and then you have Balcony Man as a, as a stunning epilogue. It almost resembles Skeleton Tree uh, instrumentally mm -hmm. in its sparks digitized drone um, that drone backdrop actually reminded me a little bit of stars of the lid at the start of this track and then it kind of the arrangement blossoms with pianos coming rolling in and then nick's voice is really um strikes a remarkable clarity in this track it's gently reverbed against the muted palette beneath him and i think he alludes in lyricism to a new story about a couple or a person who was um, dancing on a balcony at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic and I can't remember the specific details I read about this somewhere but there's direct lyrical allusions to um, the beginning of the um, pandemic and so it, it brings that theme back again um, in another more straightforward way and it's um, a stunning finale um, yeah I am bowled over with this record uh, every time I listen to it I'm more and more impressed with what it is. And I think perhaps 
obviously people love this record but perhaps people some people are are maybe a bit more hesitant to fully embrace it because it came so suddenly and because it is so small and seemingly without fanfare or um and or in the same like how ghosting we had this massive yeah um you know grandiosity to it whereas this is much more minimal and small but i think that it is um equally masterful and just I, there's not a thing about this i don't love um yeah just bra fucking Man, the, the, the vocals on the end where he just repeats that this morning is amazing and so are you i'm just like oh god i want to fucking hug you man oh yeah. man <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, I'll get into this. Uh, So, yeah. Uh, Album opens with Hand of God, of course, as as, as has been established. Uh, I I think there's a really uh, good sound to the programming on this track. Uh, You like, especially the drum programming. I think it all sounds very nice. Usually when you, when you get a musician who is a bit on the older side, you can, you can maybe see, or like a musician who is more used to to natural drums and instruments, you can maybe see some like really stiffness, roboticness in roboticness. What the fuck? Uh, you can see that in the uh, kind of programming, the sound of it, how it won't have this really organic feel to it, and I feel this has that. Uh, there's a really chilly, swirling character to the sound and the the way the instruments are contorted across this album. Uh, yeah, it's it's just a very tight album. Nothing here feels underdeveloped. It's a really cohesive package, but there's also a certain formlessness to the songs here. There's not really a traditional verse chorus structure. It's more just a delivery of of ideas and and thoughts scattered thoughts kind of about the uh the time we're living in certainly is a way to uh construe it and i think that's definitely what he's going for uh it it makes it really fun to follow this kind of structurelessness this vastness of the of the record uh the imagery on here uh is absolutely killer uh the the line that stuck with me was the uncle turning chickens into fountains line. Oh God, I fucking love that. That was pure Tom Waits. Love is, that shit. Particularly morbid and hilarious at the same time. It's really, and and the exploding sun line on the same track. Uh, uh, the empty space on here is really nice and I think it adds a lot to the atmosphere the atmosphere in particular is a really great selling point to this record that it's it's always focused on it's like this this wonderful marriage of of empty like empty space and sound it's like the the notes you don't play is the is the phrase i'm looking for and i feel yeah. it's really well embodied by what this is going for it's very tantalizing uh if if these like yeah if the sounds on this record were a house i couldn't afford to live there uh, <laughs> but it, it it would be really nice uh then you have like we, five bathrooms that you don't use, but like you live like that's cool. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, but yeah, we get we get a white elephant, which is this very distinctly politically charged song, and I thought that was very, and I thought it was a very nice turn for this record to take because there's no no moment on here that feels redundant every song is tackling a new idea for him to move forward with uh and i i really do like the kind of celebrate like the very celebratory uh sounding uh refrain at the end of this song the outro of uh, white elephant feeling very celebratory celebrating kind of the the death and the slow decline of this political 
this extremist political ideal, which uh, Nick Cave is personifying on this song. I also, on this song, do love the detail of referring to uh, the the character as an ice sculpture, you know, a, a snowflake, which hey is definitely a, a, a cute little lyrical detail I, I, I did Pointed. enjoy a lot. And yeah, also the kingdom in the sky uh, callbacks, as, as Tyler has pointed out, uh, I think that that works really well to give this album a a real backbone, a real uh, a real flow to what's what's happening here. Like there's there's a little thread connecting this all, and it's it's this repeated interrogation of not not necessarily religion itself, but I think more God and death. This repeated interrogation of of what that what that means in this time. Like uh, what? What is this that we are going through? And and that was particularly informed for me by reading up on Nick Cave's religious views. How he's not someone who considers himself religious in the sense of Catholicism, Judaism, or uh, Islam, but he does believe in a god, not necessarily a personal god, but more just some. Uh, divine agent which caused the universe to begin I, I, that, he, he posted a, uh, just on the red hand files I don't know if that's what you're alluding to but he posted just on the red hand files the other day about this very question of his like belief and religion and stuff and it was his answer was very ephemeral like it was very much like he believed in a, a divinity that linked all of humanity but isn't necessarily represented by what is yeah what we think of or what culturally and, and religiously is conceptualized as a god like it's more it's more of le it's less of an agent or a singular thing and more of a of a of an energy like he gets real um ephemeral like that on on in yeah. his letters but i think he, it gets at something that helps to unlock um what he writes about a lot no definitely and i think i think it does definitely help me <laughs> Kind of, it, it does inform what this record is is going for, what he's alluding to, what what God means to him, what this what this kingdom of heaven, uh, this kingdom in the sky rather really is, and it, it's got this this core theme of a very uncertain future, and it it puts in my mind a very particular mental image this record that being of a mound of snow and i'll get into why that is because a, a, a mound of snow of a particular variety the kind of snow you have to spend about an hour or so sweeping out of uh cleaning out of your your driveway the the hours of of hard work that the hour of hard work that goes into clearing that path for yourself and eventually having this this final bit of uh snow this mound of snow to represent your layer which as the as the climate warms as the seasons change it it melts away slowly and slowly your effort your work disappearing something that would have happened on its own naturally in your uh, driveway or wherever but you've you've needed to move it to to move forward with your life and in a weird way that's that's kind of what this record represents to me what it what it means to this this pandemic having to to push things aside having to put aside commitments to move forward having to to reflect on on our lives and and what we've had to uh what, what we've had to go through to get to the point where we are now, now a year into this pandemic. And I, I really don't know how else to put it. That's just how this record feels to me. That's yeah. what this record sounds like. It's this beautiful, disheartening triumph of an album that if I had any issue with, I just, I wanted more of it. I feel like to say that 
I wanted more of this record. It's like the highest praise I could possibly say about it. Um, because like, for me, the briskness is a positive in that way, where it leaves me just kind of wanting like a bit more, but it does as much as it can do. And I only want more because it's so good consistently. Um, and I, I'm reminded of when we review the latest uh, Weezer record. And we said that we're all incredibly tied to pandemic records. And the fact is that that's true until they're really good. Like this one is. It does feel like a next step for Nick Cave. And that this is not a record where I feel like it 100% knows what it is. It feels like it's a sincere artistic expression that hasn't been like refined into a cohesive like piece of art, but it is so strong in its expression. I wouldn't want it to refine itself because that for me would take away from its raw potent energy. This feels like a new chapter in the next, in like the fourth or fifth wave in Nick Cave's sound. And for a man who has been around so long and he's 60, like I said, he's 63 and he is still pushing himself forward good god man has been making music for 45 years if you count his early bands like mm. jesus to have relevance after 45 years is is astounding absolutely yes um, yeah anyway it's almost as old as my dad i think he <laughs> is as old as my dad <laughs> my dad it, turned it, 60 it, recently where's his fucking lit lovin <laughs> just walk he up to him say, just be like why are would, you not spitting fire he would say that his lit love in is mm-hmm. you tyler oh okay oh yeah well Ooh, yeah grandma that brings us to our favorite tracks and ratings favorite tracks and ratings for mm-hmm. carnage mm-hmm. uh we'll do it we might as well do reverse order since we yeah. oh, mm-hmm. alternate typically my three favorite tracks are old time um white elephant and shattered ground uh i I don't have a least favorite track but if you put a gun to my head i'd probably say the title track but it's still really great um i'm giving this a 9.5 out of 10 right my favorite tracks are this is so hard this is such a good album um hand hand of god um white <laughs> That's just going to be in my head all year. Jesus Christ. Um, but no, um, Hand of God, White Elephant. I'm going to say Albuquerque, but Shattered Ground is a close fourth. If I had to pick a least favorite track, I'd say Old Time, but it still is incredible. What do you want from me? Um, and I'm going to give this record an eight and a half out of ten. Uh, I, I am going to do instead of a favorites or least favorites i'm going to do my approximation of a track ranking Mm -hmm. of the whole thing because i think like the worst song on here is like a nine out of ten so and that's like being that's being a little rude um so yeah from favorite to least favorite uh balcony man shattered ground carnage um white elephant Lavender Fields, Albuquerque, Hand of God, and Old Time. Yeah, and Old Time's like a like a, it's a it's like a ten out of ten track. So fucking what, get yeah, ten out of ten record. Duh. It went balls about wow, it. Nice. Yeah. Oh, this is Borg right. giving a Dick Cave record to ten out of ten. I thought that's that, like the that, first. Uh, it's that, unprecedented. That is the first um, time Morgan's given a ten since Ohms. Oh fuck, oh. Jesus! For a new release, obviously. Oh, yeah, damn. yeah, yeah. No, you're you're damn right. You are. God, da- God damn it! All right. Well, it leads into my favorite and least favorite tracks. Favorite are "Hand of Gad," "White Elephant," and <laughs> "Balcony Man." Fucking I'm stop. gonna. Love Sam Elliott and the Big Lebowski. I'm not. I was gonna say stuff. Walton Goggins in Hateful Eight. <laughs> Nick Cave is fucking oh. Australian. Jesus, you got me uh, talking politics. My least, 
favorite track is Old Time by a small margin, and I'm going to give this album an 8 out of 10 by a small margin. Erotic. Uh, (laughs) No, 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 no. You got me talking politics. Um, Three favorite tracks. Shattered Ground, White Elephant, and Balcony Man. Uh, least favorite track again. If I have to pick one, old time, but like, fucking who this, cares? This, ag- this aggression will not stand, man. If we're doing I, Big dude, Lebowski it's, references, it's it's great. Nah, it's I, it's just. It, 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 well, I mean, something obviously something fucking, has to come last. Yes, nine out of ten. Nice. Um, this um, is the first album new release this year. And, and I think the first new release, I'm not sure what the last one was, but it's the first in a long time that all of us have given over an eight or higher. Ooh. Yeah, I can't yikes. remember the last time that happened. Um, but it's 9.0 on. on average. Whoa. So right. This, that currently puts it right at the top of our kind of collective. If I tell you that that's the same average Punisher got, (laughs) let's fucking go. The last time, the last time that all five of us gave at least an eight to a new release was um, visions of visions of bodies being burned. Nice, Um, what good company. Um, I just want to. I'm going to give you a smattering. Um, The Meadowlands, Forget the Night Ahead, Not Tourniquet, and uh, Illinois Portishead self-titled. Damn, just just spitting. No, no. the only new release that compares is Punisher, I think. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Nick Cave staying winning after so, 45 so the, years. The only new release to score higher on average is still Ohms. Yeah. It's true. Fucking... Still our highest rated new release. Well, the clipping album got a 9.4, but yeah. Wait, did it now? Yes. Fuck. All right. Yeah. I, yeah. Two. I mean, damn. Yeah, so that's pretty... our point here is go like, fucking listen fuck? to Carnage, you fucking loser. Yeah, it will be. It will be. I would say a minor miracle if we have an album that has a higher average for the rest of this year. But <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, we fucking artists. We fucking dare you. Well, Bring it. Uh, we I mean, said, like, we we said just... that about Punisher, but then two yeah. albums. Be yeah, that's go that's on, why man. we're saying it again, so we can get two more. Go ah! on, place your flower twenty one. Do it. <laughs> The challenge has been thrown down. All right, all right, yeah. Anyway. But yeah. So, what what else do we have coming out today? Um, we have a record club episode we, we on Green Day's 2009 album, uh, "21st Century Breakdown," yes. uh, courtesy of me. Yeah. <laughs> what are you reviewing next week? Before we get to that, something I want to shout out before we get into what we're reviewing next week is that friend of the podcast and podcast, two time podcast guest, Laura, is um, actually has been working on putting together and releasing a fundraiser compilation album on Bandcamp specifically to raise money for trans youth in the UK. Um, So she has. Put together a collaboration, reached out to a number of artists, uh, including King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard, and hopefully everything, everything, uh, among others, including least of all, um, potentially some members of our own podcast. So, God damn, no spoiler alerts, but you can actually go and pre-order now um, for as little as four pounds, um, and. Uh, the you can find it on bandcampcomp.bandcamp.com but you can also find it by um, checking out uh, Laura's Twitter or checking out the Jams and Tea Twitter which I have retweeted it there so go and yeah. check it out and um, pre-order because it's going to be fucking awesome yeah it'll be it'll yeah. be no surprise to anyone that um, the charity Laura's donating to means a lot to me I, I have not dealt with them even though they are based in my country uh, but they mean a lot to me, and I'd really appreciate you getting involved. Absolutely. All right, so, so next week. Next, next week, week, we are reviewing um, the first album in 16 years from Scottish mm-hmm. slowcore slash indie rock slash sad bastards Arab strap. Um, and the first album in six months by... Um, <laughs> 
What's the other thing by, we're reviewing? By uh, King Gizzard. Gizzard. Oh, that's, that's right. We, we, we'll be completing the duology of, of King Gizzard releases. Of because, KG. Yeah, because this, is, this, this new one is the second half of that. It's one album, and they've released the two halves of it separately, apparently. So we're yes. going to be reviewing the second half of this double album um, next week. So mm. stick around for that. Yeah. And I think that leads us out. So as always, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Cabela's, it's in your nature.